There is a spectrum of clinical disease that spans between asymptomatic disease to intermittent claudication, which is leg pain with exertion, and then chronic limb-threatening ischemia that's characterized by rest pain, ischemic ulceration, wounds, and gangrene, all signs of tissue loss. All of these symptoms, including claudication progressing through to critical limb ischemia, have significant clinical, functional, and psychological consequences. I know this might be a little bit small, but in terms of the natural history of atherosclerotic PAD, what I wanted to draw your attention to is that it has quite devastating consequences. For patients with intermittent claudication at five years, 20% will have had a non-fatal cardiovascular event, and the mortality rate is 15 to 30%, primarily due to cardiovascular causes. Outcomes are even worse for patients with critical limb ischemia, for patients with CLI at one year, only about 50% will be alive with two limbs, 25% will have had an amputation, and 25% will have died. And I think those are very striking, um, striking numbers. To reiterate this point, um, this study showed that for patients who had revascularization for chronic limb-threatening ischemia, at one year, amputation-free survival was only 63%, and this is um, Canadian data that's shown in blue. To speak further about some of the psychological and functional consequences of PAD, uh, patients who undergo major amputation have likened limb loss to living with clipped wings. In a qualitative study that explored their experiences with amputation, patients described this as a devastating loss and how it's not just the loss of a limb, but also a loss of a way of life. And you have to mourn that a little bit. Now we know that the morbidity and mortality associated with PAD can be reduced through timely diagnosis and effective use of secondary preventative therapies. However, there is this ongoing issue with a gap in the diagnosis and treatment of PAD. So in terms of the diagnostic gap, one study showed that amongst patients over the age of 70 or patients between age 50 to 70 who had risk factors like smoking or diabetes, PAD was detected through ankle brachial indices in almost 30% of these patients. And for those patients who were diagnosed with PAD only with no prior history of cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, or abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, 55% of those diagnoses were new. They were finding out their diagnosis for the very first time. Under treatment, as I mentioned, is also a persistent issue. So as this image shows, for patients who have PAD alone, only about 30% of patients are prescribed the secondary preventative therapies that we know have cardiovascular risk reduction benefit, that being antiplatelets, statin, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, and of course, lifestyle modifications, including smoking cessation. And this is significantly lower compared to patients who have both peripheral arterial disease and coronary artery disease, showing that PAD is significantly undertreated compared to its cardiovascular counterpart. This is again illustrated here in terms of statin use. As you can see, patients who only have PAD, only about 33% of them are on any statin, let alone a high intensity statin. And that's significantly lower than counterparts with cerebrovascular disease or coronary artery disease. So that begs the question, why is PAD underdiagnosed and undertreated. I think this is something that's still being explored, something we're trying to understand further, but some of the barriers that have been described occur at the level of the healthcare system, the healthcare provider, and the patient. I'd like to draw your attention to barriers at the healthcare provider level, which include lack of knowledge of PAD protocols, as well as the belief that another provider is responsible. This was echoed in a letter that was penned by uh, a vascular medicine specialist, vascular surgeon and primary care physician in Ontario. They highlighted that minimal time is devoted to PAD education in medical school and during family medicine and internal medicine residencies. 
that there at that time was no primary care guideline regarding PAD screening and that there are no PAD billing incentives and that vascular surgeons who are seeing many of these patients may be less comfortable with prescribing and monitoring secondary preventative therapies, especially with the rapid changes occurring on that landscape. And they may believe that this role is best fulfilled by general practitioners or internal medicine specialists. With all of that in mind, there has been a call for increased presence of vascular medicine in Canada. Given the high risk that these patients have, as well as the high cost it poses to the system, it's thought that they would be best served through collaboration by surgical specialists, medical specialists, and primary care, and that that care can be well integrated by the involvement of vascular medicine specialists. To support that, there has been an international prospective cohort study that looked at patients with new or exacerbated symptoms of PAD who attended specialty PAD clinics across the US, the Netherlands, and Australia. And what they saw is that adherence rates to secondary preventative therapies were much higher when patients were attending these specialty clinics, with now more than 80% being prescribed statins, antiplatelet therapy, and current smokers being offered smoking cessation. The main barrier that remained was referral to supervised exercise programs, which is likely more due to system barriers. But I think what this really illustrates is the value that can be added um, by having patients or um, C, C specialists who have expertise in PAD and may be able to close some of those gaps or barriers that are occurring at the level of the healthcare provider. So with that overview, I'd now like to delve more deeply into PAD within a specific population that is the renal population, patients with CKD and end-stage kidney disease. I became interested in this particular subset of patients when I started my fellowship because um, immediately quite a few people told me, oh, our patients in dialysis or our patients with CKD could really use that type of expertise. I also came across a graphic in, that was uh, put forward by one of the renal associations that said there are more heads than feet in dialysis, alluding to the fact that so many patients with end-stage kidney disease have undergone amputation. And I found that was very striking and it made me want to see how we can improve care for these patients. So today I'd like to share with you some of what I've learned about this population and how I hope we can move forward to improve their care. So to start, um, in terms of the epidemiology of PAD in this population, as I mentioned earlier, worldwide, the prevalence of lower extremity PAD in the general population is between 3 to 12%. When we look at patients with renal impairment, um, looking at multiple studies and cohorts, we can see that the prevalence is significantly higher. So for patients on dialysis, prevalence is between 23 to 46%, which is up to tenfold higher. And for patients who are non-dialysis, but with CKD stage three or higher, essentially an EGFR of 60 or less, the prevalence is between 7.4 to 24%. So still up to 5.5 fold higher than the general population. We also see that the relative risk of incident PAD increases with worsening EGFR and worsening albuminuria. So in this first uh, image on your left, what's shown is that compared to patients with, a, uh, with an EGFR of 95 indicated with the blue dot, patients with an EGFR of 15 have a two-fold higher risk of incident PAD. Similarly, in the image on the right shows that for patients with a urine ACR of five milligrams per gram, which would be considered normal, uh, if you use that as your baseline and then compare patients with uh, ACR approaching 300 milligrams per gram or severe albuminuria, the risk of incident PAD is again twofold higher. So to summarize, Prevalence of PAD in patients with CKD or on dialysis is between 5.5 to 10 fold higher than the general population, and the relative risk of incident PAD increases with worsening EGFR and albuminuria. In terms of risk factors for PAD, of course, we're all familiar with our traditional risk factors for vascular disease, which includes 
smoking, dyslipidemia, inflammation, et cetera. These cause abnormalities in the macrovasculature, such as atherosclerosis and obstruction of flow, abnormalities in the microvasculature, which is becoming increasingly recognized as important, and also cause abnormalities in the skeletal muscle, which is the end organ that's damaged through repeat ischemia and reperfusion injury. For the CKD population specifically, there have been other novel risk factors that um, have been suggested as being implicated in the pathobiology. This includes urine albumin. Uh, albuminuria is thought to be associated as a generalized marker of endothelial dysfunction. Urine albumin may also be associated with medial arterial calcification, which we'll discuss more in upcoming slides. CKD mineral and bone disorder has been um, suggested as another risk factor, given that high levels of PTH, phosphate, and calcium phosphate product have been detected in patients with PAD and CKD. Again, this is likely affecting medial arterial calcification, although it um, needs further exploration. High sensitivity CRP, white blood cell count, and fibrinogen as acute phase reactants suggest that the systemic inflammation in CKD plays a role in the development of peripheral arterial disease. Cystatin C levels have also been associated and actually independent of uh, creatinine-based EGFR. This may suggest that cystatin C is capturing some residual renal function that the creatinine is not capturing, or it could be that the cystatin C is another marker of inflammation, but again, that causal relationship needs more exploration. And finally, uric acid has been proposed as another risk factor for this population. Uh, through mechanisms of oxidative stress, inflammation, and endothelial dysfunction. So as a quick take-home point, traditional and novel risk factors are implicated in the pathophysiology of PAD in patients with CKD. Now, you're probably curious about outcomes in this population. And we spoke earlier about the outcomes and consequences of PAD in the general population um, being particularly devastating in patients with critical limb ischemia. When you combine PAD and CKD, it is unfortunately a very deadly combination. So in this study, they looked at patients with various stages of CKD and compared those who had coexisting PAD versus those without PAD. And when they looked at the cumulative incidence of lower limb complications, cardiovascular related hospitalizations and mortality, they saw that there was significantly higher incidence of these adverse outcomes in patients with coexistent PAD and CKD with worsening of outcomes as you also advance through the stages of CKD leading up to dialysis. So for cumulative incidence of mortality, for example, when you have stage five CKD on dialysis, patients with coexisting PAD and CKD have a cumulative incidence of 73%. Another study looked at patients hospitalized with PAD with or without critical limb ischemia, and again saw that when you have coexisting CKD, there is a two-fold higher amputation rate and nearly three-fold higher in hospital mortality rate. CKD also remains a significant predictor of long-term outcome with projected mortality rates after four years being as high as 78% for those with stage five CKD and coexisting PAD. That's compared to patients with PAD only who have a four-year mortality rate of around 27%. So as you can see, coexistence of PAD and CKD is associated with distinctly higher rates of amputation in hospital and long-term mortality. So the question is, how can we identify these patients who are at such high risk? Um, and so I'd like to walk through some of the diagnostic nuances for this population. In general, when we're thinking about diagnosing PAD, we're looking along this spectrum of asymptomatic disease to claudication to chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Patients with PAD and coexisting CKD are more likely to present at the advanced stages of ulceration, wounds, and gangrene, 
as opposed to presenting with claudication or breast pain. It's still unclear why that's the case, whether it has to do with unique factors in their pathophysiology or whether it's due to delayed identification and diagnosis. In the general population, we would try and elicit the symptoms of claudication using the Edinburgh Claudication Questionnaire, which is validated and has a high sensitivity and specificity. However, this questionnaire has not been validated in the renal population. Um, it's still a tool that can be used, but that um, you must be mindful of in terms of the data. In terms of our diagnostic tools, at the ankle brachial index, as you all likely know, is the first line diagnostic tool for peripheral arterial disease. In the general population, it has a sensitivity of 61% and specificity of 92%, with an ABI of less than 0.9 being diagnostic of occlusive arterial disease. The additional value of the ankle brachial index is that it has prognostic value, abnormally low or high ABIs, are indicative of your global vascular risk, even in asymptomatic individuals. ABIs are also generally, although not absolutely, correlated with walking distance, speed of walking, balance, and overall physical activity. The good thing is that the prognostic value of ABIs is preserved for patients with CKD. So when they looked at the chronic renal insufficiency cohort, they saw that similar U-shaped distribution where patients with low or high ABIs had um, increased hazard ratios for PAD, MI, heart failure, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. But the real dilemma is this issue of medial arterial calcification, which I've alluded to um, a couple of times already. Normally in atherosclerosis, we can see calcification in the intima where there's deposits within the um, atherosclerotic plaques or edges of fibrous caps. But for patients who are of older age, have CKD or diabetes, we also see a process independent of atherosclerosis called medial arterial calcification, where you get these uh, deposits of hydroxyapatite crystals in the media or the smooth muscle layer. And that causes increased stiffness and decreased compliance of the blood vessel. Medial arterial calcification results in decreased vessel compressibility, and that can lead to false normal ABIs or elevated ABIs. Anecdotally, it seems that when, patient, when people see a high or a normal ABI, even if there's thought that that may be due to calcification, there's less certainty about what to do next or whether to even proceed with further testing. But a supernormal ABI in a symptomatic patient does require further evaluation for the presence and extent of PAD. As this study showed, when symptomatic patients with a high ABI underwent angiography, PAD was absent in only about 5%. So 84% of patients did have um, infrapopetial involvement and 50% of patients were found to have multi-level disease. So this suggests that we need strategies to improve diagnosis in patients with medial arterial calcification. The next step um, could be a toe brachial index, which is more useful because toe arteries are less affected, less affected by medial arterial calcification. With TBIs, we use photoplethysmography to obtain an arterial waveform and a TBI of less than 0.6 or 0.7, depending on which resource you're referring to, is diagnostic of occlusive arterial disease. Additionally, the prognostic value of TBIs um, is there as well in that there is a linear association between TBIs and cardiovascular mortality. Looking back at this cohort of patients who had the supranormal ABIs and the majority of whom did have underlying PAD, 92% of those patients had a TBI that was less than 0.7 or diagnostic of PAD. So you can see it is a quite uh, useful test in this population. Finally, another uh, method of testing to consider would be exercise testing, which can be more sensitive for patients who have symptoms suggestive of PAD, but a normal resting ABI. Exercise can augment the pressure gradient across the stenotic lesion, and you can obtain ABIs and TBIs before and after exercise to unmask occlusive disease that may not be apparent on a resting study. Now, unfortunately, the guidelines around diagnostic evaluation of PAD in the renal population are quite sparse. There are guidelines from 2005 from the National Kidney Foundation, 
which just mentioned that at the time of dialysis initiation, all patients should be evaluated for the presence of peripheral vascular disease. However, as I've shown you, the risks of PAD are present even before you reach dialysis. And so this is likely much too late. The KDAGO guidelines from 2012 have a single line recommending that adults with CKD be regularly examined for PAD and be considered for usual approaches to therapy. But as you can see, that leaves quite a bit for the imagination. And then finally, we have our CCS guidelines from this year, uh, which are not specific to the renal population, but do mention that in asymptomatic adults who have risk factors, such as smoking or diabetes and are over the age of 50, they do suggest screening for PAD. And I would say that chronic kidney disease should be considered as one of these risk factors. They also recommend um, using an ABI or TBI to confirm diagnosis and specify that for patients with calcified arteries, a TBI may be a useful adjunct. So to summarize with uh, medial arterial calcification that is seen in CKD, a nuanced approach is required to diagnose PAD and a supranormal ABI in a symptomatic patient should not be the stopping point. It does require further evaluation for presence and extent of PAD. Finally, moving on to therapies, the general goals of therapy for patients with PAD include cardiovascular risk reduction, improvement in symptoms of claudication, and for those with chronic limb-threatening ischemia to relieve ischemic rest pain, heal ulceration, and prevent limb loss. This is quite a busy slide, but what I would just like to highlight is that there is a toolkit of therapies that exist for risk reduction for patients with PAD, both in terms of MACE reduction, as well as reduction in major adverse limb events. But despite having that evidence-based toolkit, as I mentioned, PAD remains significantly undertreated. And this is true still for patients with CKD. So in this study that looked at almost 29,000 patients who underwent peripheral vascular intervention for critical limb ischemia, almost 50% of these patients had CKD with an EGFR less than 60. And what they saw is that patients with CKD compared to those without CKD had lower prescription rates of goal-directed medical therapies, both before and also even more um, strikingly after their peripheral vascular intervention. I think there's still a lot of questions as to why that's the case, whether it's to do with comfort of prescribing these medications to this higher risk population, um, where perhaps it's more nuanced, but as you can see, it is a, a pressing issue. Now, returning to this toolkit, I won't spend as much time on therapies for MACE reduction because I think we're all more familiar with these therapies through our experience with coronary artery disease and, and stroke. But what I would like to highlight are the therapies that have benefit in terms of reducing major adverse limb events. The first is the compass regimen or rivaroxaban combined with aspirin for patients with stable cardiovascular disease or PAD. Published in 2017, this study looked at dual pathway inhibition, so an antiplatelet therapy for atherosclerosis in addition to an antithrombotic medication to address atherothrombosis. Um, when you have plaque rupture, you can trigger the coagulation cascade and thrombin formation, and that's being increasingly recognized as a key um, aspect in patients with critical limb ischemia and PAD. I won't go through the inclusion and exclusion criteria in full detail as that's something that you're likely familiar with or can refer back to. But what I did want to highlight is that the exclusion criteria for the COMPASS trial uh, was an EGFR of less than 15 mils per minute. The COMPASS trial looked at aspirin alone compared to rivaroxaban 5 milligrams BID, and then this pathway of dual pathway inhibition with aspirin and rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams BID. And they saw significant benefit with dual pathway inhibition. The absolute risk reduction for MACE was 1.3%, giving a number needed to treat of 77. A secondary analysis was performed later, and they saw a significant difference with regards to major adverse limb events as well, with an absolute risk reduction of 4.2%, giving a number needed to treat of 23. 
that makes this one of the few therapies for which we have evidence showing reduction in major adverse limb events. Now, as with many trials, um, unfortunately, patients with advanced renal disease and dialysis are typically excluded, and this limits um, what we know about treating PAD in this population. What we do know is that a secondary analysis was performed of the COMPASS trial looking at patients with renal dysfunction. They saw about a quarter of the patients enrolled and who participated in the trial had an EGFR less than 60. And what they saw is that the benefits of the COMPASS regimen were preserved in this population without any excess hazard of bleeding. So you get similar risk reduction in terms of major adverse cardiovascular events. And although there are increased bleeding events in patients with renal dysfunction, that's true irrespective of your um, antiplatelet or antithrombotic strategy. The absolute difference in terms of increase in bleeding was no uh, was unchanged between patients with an EGFR of over 60 compared to those with an EGFR of less than 60. But again, this is mainly capturing patients with moderate renal dysfunction. We still have a lot more to learn in terms of patients with advanced renal dysfunction for those on dialysis. The COMPASS trial also stratified patients with regards to comorbidities or uh, with regards to patients who have polyvascular disease. And what it showed is that for patients who have the highest risk, they actually also derive the greatest benefit from this regimen. And this includes patients with a low EGFR. So to my earlier point, there is actually a phase three clinical trial in progress, which is looking at the COMPASS regimen for patients with CKD stage four, five, or dialysis dependent end stage kidney disease. So I think it'll be very interesting to watch that space and see what the results are. And finally, I just wanted to touch briefly on the Fourier trial. I won't spend as much time on this given um, time constraints and also just overall issues with accessibility and affordability of these medications. But the Fourier trial, which looked at the PCSK9 inhibitor evolocumab, also showed significant reduction in the risk of major adverse limb events. And a secondary analysis for patients with CKD showed that LDL lowering, clinical efficacy, and safety of evolocumab were consistent across CKD groups. Now, as I mentioned earlier, other novel risk factors have been implicated in the development of PAD amongst patients with CKD. But as far as these being potential therapeutic targets, really um, a lot more research is needed. So to summarize, under treatment of PAD remains a persistent problem, including in patients with CKD. But consideration may be given to dual pathway inhibition or the COMPASS regimen for this high risk population, as long as their EGFR is above 15 and they meet the other inclusion and exclusion criteria. So to sort of bring all of that together, what I really hope that you'll take home is that PAD is a disease with devastating consequences that remains underdiagnosed and undertreated. Patients with CKD are at significantly increased risk of developing PAD and have unique considerations in terms of risk factors, diagnostic evaluation and treatment. The coexistence of PAD and CKD is associated with distinctly higher rates of amputation in hospital and long-term mortality. And PAD patients would ideally be served by close collaboration between surgical specialists, medical specialists and primary care and this care can be integrated and optimized by vascular medicine specialists. To that point, I'd like to speak to our efforts to take a more collaborative approach to help bridge this gap in PAD diagnosis and treatment, and specifically the work that we're doing with the Division of Nephrology. So with the support of the Division of Nephrology and General Internal Medicine, um, I've had the pleasure of starting a general nephrology vascular medicine clinic at St. Joe's earlier this year. This clinic specializes in the management of PAD for patients with CKD. Given the even greater lack of evidence around management for patients with um, end-stage kidney disease and their exclusion from trials on the many therapies we have available, for the time being, this clinic is primarily focused on non-dialysis patients with CKD. 
The goals of the clinic are to improve timely risk stratification and diagnostic evaluation of these patients and to help with medical optimization. So as I mentioned, the clinic started in September and is currently operating on a monthly basis within the nephrology clinic area. The referral criteria for this clinic is that if you have non-dialysis patients with CKD who have any of the following, they would be eligible. That would be symptoms of PAD like claudication and rest pain, signs of PAD such as absent pulses, discolored toes, non-healing ulcers, gangrene, et cetera, or a history of vascular surgery, vascular amputation, moderate to severe carotid stenosis, or carotid endarterectomy and stenting. This referral criteria is also available if you were to enter the referral order into Dovetail. The order comes up as ambulatory referral to General Nephrology Vascular Medicine Clinic um, and has those details within it. So although we're still in the very early stages of the start of this clinic, I just wanted to share some of the referrals that have come in in terms of the types of patients that we're seeing and how we might have an impact. So for example, one of the patients referred is a patient with stage 3B CKD, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and diabetes, so many of those high-risk comorbidities, who's been referred for one year of intermittent claudication, which was only identified when they were screened as a possible candidate for this clinic. Another patient with stage 3, 3B CKD who has known PAD with a prior revascularization, as well as comorbidities, including coronary artery disease, diabetes, and smoking was referred. They had peripheral arterial angioplasty and stenting around nine months ago, but quickly reoccluded their stent and currently are in aspirin alone. Previously, they were on river oxaban, but at an incorrect dose of five milligrams daily. And this had been stopped by another provider given unclear indication for the medication. Lastly, and we have another patient that was referred as a patient with stage four CKD who has known PAD with previous revascularization, as well as comorbidities, including coronary artery disease, heart failure, diabetes, and smoking, who is still on dual antiplatelet therapy more than one year after her peripheral arterial angioplasty and stenting, and more than seven years after her unstemmy and cabbage. So for all of these patients, what we're really hoping to do is optimize with regards to counseling on smoking cessation, prescription of structured home-based exercise, which I do using guidance from the CCS guidelines, review of their vascular risk reduction therapies uh, with, a specific, you know, with a high focus in terms of their antiplatelet and antithrombotic medications, but also looking at other risk factors such as dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. And then as necessary, we would refer on for wound care, vascular surgery, or other um, specialist services. Now, it certainly could seem like a bit of an uphill battle trying to treat PAD in this very vulnerable population when there is a significant lack of evidence on how best to do so. But I think given the significant risks that exist within this population and the consequences it can have clinically, functionally, and psychologically, we can't let that lack of evidence be um, a reason or a barrier to, to really trying to improve their care. But I think what we can do to try and bridge some of those gaps is work together. And I feel like this collaboration is so key. I've been very grateful for the support of the Division of Nephrology and recognizing the importance of um, involvement of vascular medicine and in starting this clinic. But I also recognize that a lot of patients with CKD aren't followed by nephrologists. They may have more stable CKD or less advanced CKD and will come through your clinics, either in internal medicine, cardiology, or in other settings as well. And so I hope you'll keep some of this information in mind in terms of the risks that um, exist for this population and the gap that exists overall in terms of diagnosis and management of PAD. And we'll consider whether or not your patients may be a good candidate for these services. So when you're seeing your patients, what I would ask is that you consider asking your patient, do you have discomfort in your legs with walking that's relieved when you rest? And look to see if there are physical exam signs of PAD, such as absent pulses, discolored toes, non-healing ulcers, or gangrene. And finally, see whether or not they have a history of vascular surgery, amputation, carotid stenosis, or prior endarterectomy or stenting 
that may indicate that they would benefit from further monitoring and optimization. And if that is the case, uh, please consider referring them to the General Nephrology Vascular Medicine Clinic at St. Joe's. And with that, I will bring my presentation to a close. I wanted to thank all of you for your attention this morning and for taking the time to listen. Uh, also a huge thanks to my program director in vascular medicine, Dr. Sonia Anand for supporting this initiative and the divisions of nephrology and general internal medicine for their ongoing support as well. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Radha. That was, uh, that was really, really very good and uh, very insightful. Uh, I'm going to, uh, there are a number of questions and then a raised hand. Um, and uh, so I'm going to just go over the questions in the order I received them. Uh, so we had a question from Dr. Anand. Uh, the, uh, you know, thanks, Ra uh, Radha, great presentation. How do you differentiate between arterial calcification versus atherosclerosis and CAD, PAD? Uh, question using di diagnostics. And I think you did allude to this in your presentation. So I think um, certainly some of the differentiation we can see would be um, with, um, with the ABIs. So when we're seeing the non-compressibility on our ankle brachial index, that is more suggestive of arterial calcification um, as opposed to just sort of traditional atherosclerosis. And that's when we would likely consider further investigations such as a toe brachial index. Um, sometimes we can also look at um, the images directly to see whether or not we're seeing much in the way of traditional atherosclerosis and plaque uh, buildup um, as opposed to uh, medial arterial calcification. So uh, I think through imaging as well as non-invasive diagnostics, we can um, get a sense of whether or not there is atherosclerosis or medial arterial calcification. Certainly the two can coexist. So in that study that looked at patients with supranormal ABIs, uh, who obviously have underlying calcification, uh, the majority of them did also have atherosclerotic PAD uh, on angiography. Hopefully that answers your question, Dr. Ramond. Thanks, Radha. Uh, the second question is, uh, thank you for, again, comment. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Can you comment on patients at greatest risk of medial arterial calcification? So the patients at greatest risk of medial arterial calcification in general are those with um, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and with aging. Um, so with cellular senescence, they, we do see more medial arterial calcification. And then the thought is that with CKD, there are certain drivers that accelerate that process as well. So as I mentioned, urine albuminuria is thought to be associated with promotion of medial arterial calcification. Um, bone mineral disorder in terms of elevated levels of PTH, phosphate, and calcium phosphate product. Um, and so um, there are certain drivers within CKD that seem to accelerate that process. Um, but certainly more that needs to be learned in terms of whether our treatments that we currently use for atherosclerotic PAD have similar benefit in terms of um, medial arterial calcification. Thanks, Radha. And then we have a hand up from Dr. Darasami. He, uh, he raised his hand before I go to the other questions. Dr. Darasami, if you want to ask your question. Dr. Darasami. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. That was an excellent presentation. And I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, importance of uh, a multidisciplinary approach to this condition. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to mention in the pathophysiologic mechanisms is the role of endothelin. Now, I think this is an extremely important uh, concept to know is that endothelin, in fact, is the, no is the most potent vasoconstrictor known to mankind. And in fact, uh, endothelin, uh, I, I happen to have met the, the, the uh, developers or the people that worked with the first endothelin receptor blocker, which was Bosentin. And no doubt they've shown that uh, endothelin, in fact, is probably the final common pathway uh, in, the, in the genesis of, of patients with peripheral arterial disease, just as it is in the case of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And as you know, it's now well known that chronic kidney disease is one of the causes of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, what's interesting is that you mentioned uh, the association between chronic kidney disease and peripheral arterial disease. And in fact, it's known that endothelin, in fact, 
decreases the GFR. And in fact, there's, there's evidence uh, based on some early laboratory findings that when endothelin was infused into patients, into individuals, there was a dose-related reduction in the GFR. So that is probably one of the important mechanisms of the association between chronic kidney disease and peripheral arterial disease. So once again, endothelin, recept uh, endothelin and endothelin receptor blockers are, are possibly important in, in the genesis of uh, peripheral arterial disease. And just finally, I'd just like to mention, there is a study that I recall where they've looked at both, uh, in one study, they looked at both Santin um, in the benefits in peripheral arterial disease, and no doubt they've shown some benefit. But also more recently, they've also shown a study using sildenafil together with bosentin in patients with systemic sclerosis and, um, and uh, a vascular disease affecting mainly the, digital, uh, the digits, uh, you know, causing digital ischemia. So once again, there is a definite role for, the, uh, for using um, the endothelin receptor blockers and possibly uh, nitric oxide uh, generating uh, drugs such as uh, sildenafil. It's very interesting. Thank you for adding that. Um, I think it'll be a really interesting pathway for further research. And, um, you know, certainly if we can improve or increase the number of therapies that have a role in reducing major adverse limb events, that would be a huge benefit to our patients. So thank you for that input, Dr. Dorsum. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. So I'm going to move on to the next question. So Dr. Gerstein had asked a question about a percentage of CKD that is caused by PAD. So um, that's a great question, Dr. Gershin. In my literature review so far, I haven't specifically found information as opposed, you know, in terms of how does PAD um, specifically lead to um, worsening of renal failure. Uh, there is some thought that, you know, having PAD does worsen uh, renal, renal function and renal prognosis, but it's still, I would say, um, an area that needs more research in terms of the, the literature review that we've been undertaking. Um, I'm actually working with a nephrology postdoctoral fellow at um, the University of Toronto who's interested in doing more research in this area. And so we've been trying to do a more systematic literature review. And that's been one of our questions is sort of that dual um, relationship or bidirectional relationship. And I think there's still more information to really be learned in terms of how CKD um, progression is affected by PAD. Thanks, uh, Radha. Uh, the next question is by, uh, and just another question by Dr. Gerstein, is ABR or TBI done routinely on new dialysis patients? So from my understanding and speaking with the uh, nephrologist so far, it is not done routinely for new dialysis patients at our center. Um, I think more often when they see patients who have uh, signs of tissue loss, like ulceration or gangrene, they would then be referring on to vascular surgery. And at that point, um, the vascular diagnostic studies might be performed, but it is not yet a routine part of diagnostic evaluation when patients are being initiated for dialysis. Um, the, uh, the next question from Dr. Pine, uh, which, uh, and it's been asked twice, in patients with CKD and limb events, particularly those with diabetes, rather than macrovascular disease, we often see a lot of microvascular disease. Do you approach and treat this in the same way as microvascular PAD? And another question along the same line, and what are the diagnostic tools for identifying microvascular disease, if different? So that's a great question. I mean, I think certainly an area that we're still trying to understand better. Um, in terms of diagnostic tools for microvascular disease, more and more we're seeing, you know, efforts to understand this with coronary artery disease. We have several patients um, who have presented with uh, quite typical symptoms of coronary artery disease, but have been found to have normal uh, angiographies or no obstructive coronary artery disease. And uh, we've seen them being referred on to cardiologists who are then investigating for microvascular angina using either perfusion imaging or uh, cardiac MRI. Uh, to my knowledge, we don't have specific diagnostic tools for microvascular disease for PAD specifically as of yet. Um, but that is something that we'll have to continue working on. And then in terms of how we approach and treat microvascular PAD, uh, right now, really, I think there just isn't good enough evidence in terms of what which therapies are effective for microvascular disease um, compared to our traditional macrovascular atherosclerosis. So for the time being, we are employing many of 
of the same treatments in terms of antiplatelet therapy, hypertension control, lipid lowering, and uh, glucose lowering. But um, in terms of antithrombotic therapy, that's something that we often debate even in our vascular medicine clinics is when we're seeing more medial arterial calcification or if there's suggestion of microvascular disease, um, we just don't have as clear evidence for using the compass regimen. So that's something that still um, needs a lot more research in. Um, and then another question, how involved is vascular surgery in multidisciplinary care of such patients? And have you seen referrals from surgeons? So with our vascular medicine clinic that Dr. Anand runs at McMaster in the Boris Clinic, uh, we do have a great collaboration with vascular surgery. Um, as part of our vascular medicine fellowship, we rotate through vascular surgery for around one to two months. And so that really helps in terms of building that collaboration and understanding of the unique role that each of the specialists play in PAD care. And the vascular surgeons here are also quite um, keen, I think, in terms of bridging this gap that we see in the diagnosis and treatment of PAD. So um, in terms of involvement of vascular surgery, often what we're seeing is that they will refer for the medical management, especially more complex patients or patients with polyvascular disease, those at higher risk, um, while they continue their surveillance in terms of surgical indications. And I think part of that also comes down to the fact that the vascular surgeons are often seeing very high volumes in their clinics, like between 60 to 70 patients a day, and they don't have the time to necessarily look and make sure patients are being treated to target when it comes to their vascular risk factors. So they do appreciate that assistance from vascular medicine. Um, I haven't yet had a, a referral from vascular surgery to this PADCKD clinic specifically, but the information has been dispersed amongst vascular surgery and was received well as a, a service that would be a benefit. Uh, I'm going to just uh, skip a question before I come back to Dr. Holbrook's question, but uh, Dr. Preptani, because I think this is an important question to answer, Dr. Preptani mentioned that he's at HHS and how does he send a referral if he does not have dovetail? And before re referring, do you want an ABI and how do I order a TBI? I think that's an important question. Mm -hmm. Great question. So um, in terms of ordering ABIs and TBIs, those can be done uh, through the medical diagnostics unit at Hamilton General Hospital. So uh, that can be found on EPIC. If you type in ankle brachial index, um, it'll bring it up. And I think there's a separate order for toe brachial index as well, or you can just enter that in the comments of your ABI order. It will also ask you if you want them with or without exercise. And I would say generally, if your patients are able to exercise, that does add value to the results um, and our interpretation of those results. And then in terms of making a referral, if you don't have dovetail, just a standard uh, paper referral like on a usual consult form would be fine. Um, and it can be directed to the Nephrology Central booking at St. Joseph's Hospital. And uh, we have two, uh, two minutes left. Uh, so for lymphedema, uh, uh, Dr. Holbrook has asked, uh, would you mind commenting on what vascular medicine can do for our occasional, very difficult to treat patients with severe lymphedema? Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it's certainly a population that we still have difficulty treating even in our vascular medicine clinics. Uh, we have some patients here in Hamilton and then also as part of our fellowship, I've been to the lymphedema clinics um, that run through Oakville. Um, really, what we end up doing is a lot of guidance with regards to um, physiotherapy for manual lymphatic drainage and massage. Um, Lymphedema Canada has some resources in terms of physiotherapists who are trained um, in those services. And so that can be a helpful resource for patients. And uh, compression therapy as well is another mainstay of treatment for lymphedema patients um, and then counseling with regards to lifestyle modifications, exercise and weight loss. Um, for some patients being referred for lymphedema, we do make sure that we're completing a diagnostic workup in terms of ruling out venous reflux, um, and we sometimes proceed with lymphangiograms as well to see if we can identify the cause of their lymphedema, but uh, regardless in terms of treatment, those would be the mainstays. And uh, we're right on the dot, and I don't want to ignore a question, but uh, Dr. Neri asked, are phosphate binders taught to slow the rate of arterial calcification? And if so, do the various phosphate binders differ in this effect? And that would be our last question. Um, that's a great question. I, I haven't come across phosphate binders being specifically looked at in terms of medial arterial calcification for PAD. I think that's 
um, an area that probably still needs further study, but um, I, I, it's possible that that's been looked at in other vascular diseases like coronary artery disease. Um, but I, I'd have to go back to the literature and get back to you on that, Dr. Neary, which I'd be happy to do so. Oh. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Radha. Again, a lot of uh, great feedback coming in from chat and Vinay. That was a great presentation, very informative. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us to, uh, today for the Grand Rounds. Thank you very much.